schon verzogen. Good afternoon, and also good day to those who are joining us online from different parts of the world. I don't know whether it is morning or evening, anyway, good day to all of them. Let us begin with a prayer for human rights, a little prayer. God of justice, help us recognize the dignity and the rights of all humankind Open our hearts to hear your teachings. Open our eyes to the sufferings of those who are denied their basic economic, social, political, and uh, human uh, social rights. 
civil rights. Let our voices join in declaring that all humanity is sacred and all human rights must be respected. Amen. So I would invite uh, our rector, <coughs> Professor Andrea Bozzolo, to welcome the gathering and then uh, we will continue with the rest of the program. We, I'll present the program. Please go. Good afternoon to all you present here and welcome in the Salesian Pontifical University and good day to those who are following us online. In the first place, a hearty welcome to the professors Jako, Rai, Hans-Georg, Chris, Karl, Ulrich, Alexander, Lewis and Francesco who have come all the way from South Africa, the United States of America, Germany, Holland, Belgium, Spain, and Southern Italy. As I am told, together with colleagues from over 20 countries, including our professor, Francis Vincent, who would be emeritus by the end of this academic year, you have been engaging in empirical researches and publications related to human <coughs> rights, religious pluralism, and transformational leadership. As the title of a roundtable conference indicates, you are here to share your immense experience of contributing to public theology through the empirical study of human rights. The society and church at large certainly stand to gain from the efforts of scientific communities like yours. Besides, your research experience can be an added stimulus for our own academic community to render its intellectual service for making the world a better place. Our university campus is rather familiar to some of you. We hope those of you who are new to our campus will feel at home. So welcome, benvenuti, e buon lavoro a tutti voi. Grazie. To welcome the guest speakers in the Indian way, I now invite the Dean of our Faculty of Theology, Professor Sahaidas Fernando, some staff members from India, and students to don each of them, each of the speakers, with uh, a ponade, a golden mantle. Golden mantle in India signifies all the blessings you can imagine from above. And also our own best wishes. So please stand and wow. each one can go into any of the speakers. Please come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nice biviale. Thank you. Okay, if you want to stand, uh, you can take a picture. Because afterwards you can remove them, so you don't need to keep it all the time. Please come. Nee, it's okay. Please go ahead. Go ahead. I can also jump. Should we dance? Yeah. <laughs> you can smile, just smile. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So before we hearing the interventions of our speakers, uh, I mean, the moderator of our uh, roundtable conference will uh, introduce them. No, so we'll come to know who is who. But now um, I don't. We didn't even mention the names and the 
uh, indicate who is who, but we'll come to know that. After the first, uh, so moderator is Professor uh, Francesco Zaccaria, and he's celebrating his uh, 20th anniversary of his ordination just today. Okay, so thank you, thank you. And we are happy that uh, this conference coincides with this celebration, no? Uh, after the first four interventions, we shall have a break of 15 minutes from 4.30 to 4.45. And our economist, economist of the faculty, Professor Wim Collin, has prepared some snacks for you so we can enjoy. And during the break time, you can also uh, uh, go, I mean, speak to the, to the guest speakers and uh, get to know them, talk to them, and learn or uh, discuss what you heard from them. And then after the break, we will begin again at 4.45. So no, we'll have only 15 minutes of break. We'll continue with other three presentations, then discussion with all of us, and the conclusion. So before 6 o'clock, we hope to finish everything. But then at the end of the conference, they'll, they'll be still around. So those who want, those of us who want to simply talk to them, <coughs> come to know them, or discuss some questions privately also, you could do so. So now I leave the floor to the moderator, Professor Francesco Zaccari. Bon pomeriggio, good afternoon. Thank you for being here and thank you uh, to Professor Anthony for organizing this round table and congratulations also for his achievement and his emeritus status that he will uh, soon achieve. The theme of the conference, Empirical Approach to Public Theology, the Case of Human Rights Research, will be discussed by the distinguished panel members here today. My task is mainly to keep the timing tight because we have a very full schedule, but I would also like to uh, say a couple of words, introductory words, to the theme of today. I'm an I will try in these minutes, I will have the timer also for me. Uh, it's, uh, in these few minutes, I would like to answer, to, 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 to give some thoughts to the question, how empirical theology can help theology to become public theology? That is a theological reflection, so meaning a theology which is valuable for the societal and academic discourses which can have a reasonable and plausible voice in the public arena today. I start from the invitation by, made to theology by Pope Francis in Veritatis Gaudium to engage in cross-disciplinarity with other sciences. I don't know, the English version is cross-disciplinarity, but I prefer the Italian and Latin transdisciplinarity because in a transdisciplinary way, that's the way they use it in other sciences, transdisciplinarity. <laughs> and to overcome, that's what Veritatis Gaudium said, I'm quoting, fatal separation between theory and practice. End of quote. My point is that practical theology and special empirical theology, epistemology and methodology as it was developed and practiced by the Dutch theologian Hans van der Ven, who initiated the human rights and religion research program we are talking about today, this approach does offer useful insights in what transdisciplinarity can look like for theology today. Van der Ven called it intradisciplinarity, but the concept has many overlaps with what transdisciplinarity is called today. Transdisciplinarity requires a step beyond exchange interdisciplinarity between disciplines. It has, it has to go beyond them to integrate, transcend, and change the disciplines itself, themselves. The model, the model of intradisciplinarity is practiced in all fields of knowledge, in the natural sciences, as well as in the humanities, in the philosophical sciences, as well as in the theological sciences. 
There are several examples of this model giving rise to new disciplines, biochemistry, sociolinguistic, psycholinguistics, the different disciplinary interwavings of neuroscience and so on. Theology too is always called upon to expand its methodology and incorporate tools and theories from other sciences, adapting and integrating them in view of its formal object. Has this not been the case for dogmatic theology with respect to philosophy? Biblical theology also in the 20th century in incorporated and adapted the methods of, and theories of literary analysis, just as today's theological bioethics, theolo um, moral theology, has taken on the knowledge of biology. Now, according to its object of study, practical theology or pastoral theology must also adopt appropriate methods and tools to read reality and praxis. And these methods are, according to Van der Ven, the empirical ones, just as theological disciplines that address themselves to the texts of the past, biblical, patristic, dogmatic texts, must assume a historical, must take an, uh, an historical critical hermeneutics, practical theology addressing itself to the text of the presence, of the present social phenomena, ecclesial practices, personal convictions and faith stories, must assume an empirical critical hermeneutics. What can this empirical approach in practical theology teach in order to achieve more transdisciplinarity between theology and the other sciences. In those who propose transdisciplinarity, both from the field of natural sciences and from the field of humanities, there is a positive intent to overcome the parcelling out, the division of knowledge in the face of the complexity of reality, and to push hard sciences towards reconciliation with the human sciences, but also with arts, literature, and spiritual experience. However, what can be learned from the history of practical theology is that this dialogue, in order to be effective, must be circular, circular and symmetrical. That means open to mutual critical contributions. The risk of wanting to place a hierarchy in this dialogue is also present in those who call for transdisciplinarity. For example, Edgar Morin would see an integration of the sciences according to a hierarchy with the natural sciences at the top and the humanities at the bottom. On the other hand, the same risk may appear in those who propose transdisciplinarity starting from the theological field, overturning the pyramid and putting theological knowledge at the top, which illuminates and gives meaning, gives meaning and direction to the other scientific discoveries. Not in this sense, I think, should the invitation of Veritatis Gaudium be interpreted. This invitation will not be accepted by the other sciences if it is understood as an affirmation of a superiority of theology over all other knowledge, but only if it is understood that the Christian revelation is not an abstract or deductive knowledge, but an understanding of a truth that continues to unveil itself in history, in different loci theologici, and through different paths. And if it is accepted that the other sciences, natural sciences, humanities, art, literature, can also contribute to the, advance, to the advancement of theology in the knowledge of this revelation. I conclude. By analogy, between theology and the other sciences should be established that circular relationship of mutual help that Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes, configures for the relationship between the church and the world. In order to know better the truth of the cosmos and of the human being, 
Not only can theology offer its critical contribution to the other sciences, but at the same time, theology can learn from the other sciences, not only to communicate more clearly the truth of faith today, but also to better understand and interpret these truths of faith. In these terms, I think it is possible to talk about public theology in contemporary societies. Empirical theology and the research on human rights that we are discussing today are, in my view, a good example of transdisciplinary and public theology. So now I give the floor. Thank you. I give. You can. You can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it changes. <laughs> okay. So. I'm honored to give the floor to Professor Luis Oviedo from Pontificia Università Antonianum with a presentation doing theology from below, looking for the right sense of the human in human rights. Thank you very much. Uh, is the presentation ready? One minute. Not yet. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor for me to reach in this celebration in honor of our good friend, uh, uh, Francis Vincent Anthony. And it's an honor and a pleasure to, to share with you our ideas, research, sensitivities towards a more empirical approach in theology, or what we could call a theology from below. That is a project I am trying to pursue in the last uh, in few years and uh, encountering a lot of resistance around, in indeed, Several of my students, for instance, of master level students, consider that uh, a theology from below is not uh, a sacred theology. It's a uh, theology that could be too dirty to be considered something uh, um, dignifying and uh, high. So that theology should be always done from above. So the case of uh, Christian anthropology and in convergence with the human rights is a case to test this model, uh, whether or uh, ask the question or to address the question, whether a theology from below would be more uh, mm, uh, a better program, a bit better approach to deal uh, with this uh, um, issue that sometimes is uh, quite controversial. Do you find it? Uh, it's a Something is uh, not working. Yeah, I was trying to speak about artificial intelligence, but it seems that it's too, too early. <laughs> we need to, to cover uh, uh, the steps earlier. Yeah, you, you yeah. carry on. Yeah, but it's important we'll to show up. the slides. Uh, anyway, uh, the questions I will raise are uh, that... Uh, or one of the theses I will uh, defend is that uh, the idea of human rights is, uh, has been growing uh, as a result of a cultural evolutionary process and as such uh, has been uh, trying, uh, uh, failing, trying again, correcting and learning from the practical uh, field, uh, from the concrete field, uh, in order to better uh, find out which uh, would be the best uh, representation, or, uh, the best uh, charter of human rights. Uh, uh, consider the problem that is uh, already a classical. That, uh, almost everybody accepts that human rights have been, um, have been uh, inspired by Christian tradition uh, so almost everybody agrees with this, and there are many articles published in this sense, uh, state claiming that human rights uh, have a clear Christian root. But uh, in that case, the big issue, the big question is, how is possible that uh, inside uh, many churches, especially the Catholic, the Catholic Church, we were so, so slow uh, to apply, to assume, to defend uh, many of these uh, human rights that we now take for granted, but that were not so uh, clearly uh, mm, assumed before. 
so three or four cases are quite illuminating. For instance, uh, the Catholic Church very lately uh, has mm, uh, pronounced against death penalty, uh, or, or has understood the right to life in a radical way that uh, would uh, uh, be against death penalty, uh, as, I far, as far as I remember, was the catechism in the 80s. Okay, yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. um, the catechism uh, in the 80s, uh, the Catholic Church that was uh, establishing uh, the, what now for everybody, almost everybody, is uh, uh, obvious. Um, the Right uh, against or rights against slavery. Uh, even if this is uh, surprising for you, but for Catholic Church was uh, something that we only lately uh, assume uh, the uh, criti crit a critical stance against slavery. Consider until the second half of 19th century, still uh, Spanish uh, uh, institutions were practicing slavery. And the, even our brothers, the Jesuits, were uh, holding slaves or uh, driving slaves in their uh, establishments or plantations in Virginia uh, to uh, support the University of Georgetown, something that they have recognized. Perhaps the question is that uh, the uh, Thomistic theology, Thomas theology, was uh, considering slavery as a, a natural uh, right and so uh, sanctioned by uh, divine uh, will. Uh, well, for, for us now is, is a, a big disaster, but it's how things were. My point is that these ideas have evolved uh, and it's pointless to deny. No, it's not evolving. It's, uh, the tradition is firmly established and always the same. No, it was not always the same. It has evolved and thanks God, is still evolving and is still alive. And the third example, the rights of women. So the rights of women in the Catholic Church, we, have, uh, we are still struggling to recognize uh, uh, several rights, but even if a, good, a long way has been done. So uh, the point is that uh, human rights uh, as uh, anthropology in, uh, in general has been uh, the result of a uh, maturation that I could uh, describe in terms of uh, some uh, joint uh, venture, some entrenchment, some, uh, some conjunction between uh, the uh, Christian tradition in, on one side and the Enlightenment tradition on, on the other. So that is a case that we could describe in terms of cultural coevolution, uh, taking uh, a term uh, that is, uh, comes from the biological studies or evolutionary studies. No? Human rights means an open and uncertain project confronting issues such, such as the new forms of control, the new generation of expanding rights and their connection with sustainability issues. So these are new issues that are now uh, in, arising and that uh, demand for an updating, uh, a steady updating of the topic of human rights. The other point I want to stress, uh, the second one, uh, no, this is not this one, uh, former, uh, former slide, yeah, this, okay. Uh, this uh, is the, the Christian anthropology is an evolved and adaptive cultural form. It's not necessary that I extend too much on this point because it is clear, at least for those who are uh, working in the field of Christian anthropology for more than 30 years, like me, that uh, the Christian anthropology is again not a fixed uh, set uh, of ideas, but has been evolving through history. Even uh, those uh, ideas that are uh, more constant, we could say, in the Christian anthropological tradition, the three main issues, yeah, that we are created at the image of God, that we are fail, fail, failing, failing creatures uh, because of the original sin, and that we are redeemed and regenerated through grace, that's, that even these three big ideas have been submitted to constant pressure from different sides and have uh, known 
different understandings, expressions, uh, interpretations, especially through the big uh, debates and discussions taking place, for instance, in the fifth century between Augustinus and uh, Pelagius, then in the reform time between uh, Catholics, Lutherans, uh, Calvinists, and other reform, uh, reforming expressions, <coughs> or even inside the Catholic tradition in the 7th and 18th century between Jansenists and Jesuits, or the discussions between Jesuits and Dominicans, the famous discussion, the auxilies. And um, so uh, through all these debates and discussions, what we were uh, achieving is a more accurate uh, understanding of the complexity and difficulties and mystery of human nature and human uh, condition. So uh, my point is that uh, Christian anthropology has been growing, has been evolving through history, and at the same time, this evolution has uh, found a convergence with uh, the project of human rights that is born rather in the enlightened, uh, in, from the enlightenment and these other or these alternative sensitivities. Yeah, the idea of reverse engineering of human rights and the Latin anthropology is that we could, in an ideal program, research program, try to reconstruct back the uh, events, experiences, um, and perceptions, uh, failures, historical failures that were uh, uh, time after time giving rise to a more uh, open and committed uh, consciousness or uh, awareness on uh, the topic of human rights. The other point I want to stress is that uh, all this um, process is very empirical, so that Christian anthropology has never been just a hermeneutic process. If you follow the uh, anthropological pages in the fabulous uh, texts of St. Augustine, like Confessiones or uh, Civitate Dei, you perceive that his uh, understanding of human condition is deeply rooted in his own uh, experiences, failures, uh, um, um, sinfulness, but uh, expectations, joys, uh, deep experiences, and so on. My point is that Christian anthropology has never been uh, too theoretical, or not just the a theoretical project, but a uh, more uh, empirical, uh, or a combination of uh, em em empirical perception and uh, theoretical construction. Uh, not the former one. Yeah. yeah, human rights, Christian anthropology, and empirical research in theology. Christian anthropology has been strongly influenced by historical and contextual perception, the current um, convergence between human rights and Christian anthropology is a point of arrival after centuries of maturation and many failures or negative experiences that can be described in pragmatic terms of trial, error, and correction. And human rights means an open and uncertain project confronting issues such as the new forms of control, the new generation of expanding rights, and their connection with sustainability issues. Regarding uh, the issue of new forms of control that inspire or motivates the search for uh, a new charter of uh, rights, uh, some experts uh, talk about the fourth generation of human rights and concern uh, this uh, swift uh, growth and expansion of uh, um, intelligent systems of control and interaction with humans that render uh, much easily uh, manipulation, uh, f uh, transmission of fake news, uh, and other forms of uh, uh, how to say, uh, of limiting human freedom and so on. And so we need to be um, very um, um, aware and, uh, and, and, yeah, and at the same time uh, worried about these developments. The second point is the one about, no, please don't change. <laughs> it's because of the time going. Ah, well, 
uh, is the one of the uh, new charters of rights. <coughs> there are, some of them are social rights and, and environmental rights. But the other ones are sexual rights. There is a big discussion about uh, uh, recognitions of uh, uh, sexual expression, uh, the right to change sex at any age, uh, the rights uh, associated to the ideas of gender, LGTB, and so on. And so, and so there is a big discussion regarding to what extent abortion, for instance, to to what extent these uh, rights or charter of rights that many associate with the third generation charter of rights um, allows or invites to a, an updating and so to what extent Christian anthropology should uh, um, take part in the discussion. I am convinced that uh, we need to take part in the discussion and reach into these issues. And then the sustainability issues that pose uh, another challenge to the development of human rights because um, more so the rights to live in a healthy environment uh, mean uh, duties uh, from the side of those that could enjoy an unrestrained freedom to use their cars or uh, to, um, uh, to make any kind of behavior. So these rights imply uh, strong duties and it's not clear how to manage uh, this. Uh, yeah, Christian anthropology is open to evolution, change, and adaptation, as has happened uh, with the inclusion of rights previously ignored <coughs> in the Christian tradition, but it's not clear uh, to what extent. Yeah, the next one, and we <coughs> go to the end. The next uh, slide, please. Who is changing the slides? Ah, no, so. So uh, I suggest that uh, the way uh, theology uh, enters the discussion is uh, keeping uh, in mind these four criteria. First one, very easy, do not harm. Uh, or human rights should always be conceived in such a way that no one is harmed, uh, is uh, dam damaged in the short or long run. The second criteria is do the greatest good to the greatest number of people, as in the utilitarian tradition of human rights. But I think that we can adopt a theological Christian version of the utilitarian principle. And so in this case, if we are not ashamed to be in good company with utilitarians of the tradition of Stuart Mill and so on, uh, I think that the idea is, uh, is uh, in important. Third criteria of human rights must be conceived as a way that in, uh, increases sociality, compassion, solidarity, and concern for others more than an, in an individual way. So in the sense of the uh, third uh, generation of human rights. So that an important criteria would be less individualistic oriented rights, more socially or morally, ethically oriented rights. And the fourth is the principle of vital, vit, vitality. Human rights must be, must be conceived as a way to promote life in all its dimension, expression, and so. There is uh, some li recent literature that, are, uh, that is uh, describing a link, a deep link between uh, religious mind traditions and uh, life or vitality, or promoting life in, uh, in all its ways and expression, so that uh, any, any charter of human rights should be uh, conceived uh, as a, um, a platform that uh, would uh, render uh, more vitality or provide more vitality or uh, heal the wounds against life that many populations suffer. And the last one, I think. Okay. Yes. Because 15 minutes are up, but I can give you the two minutes I said. No, no, one minute. This anthropology understands human nature in a tension between its greatness as a divine creation and the, its profound limits and failings as a consequence of symptoms of sin. <coughs> so that is the general criteria. Christian anthropology is always a tension between human greatness and human failure. Uh, so um, we need to be very realistic when 
thinking uh, about human rights in uh, taking into account this. Always uh, uh, testing or checking what's uh, the way, uh, whether it works or not works. So for instance, the right to change sex at, uh, in the uh, teenage, uh, for teenagers has been shown through empirical studies that is uh, damaging for many people. So uh, that is a, a case in which empirical uh, testing is uh, um, um, in, inviting to review or to revise uh, this principle. Then it moves between the greatest capacity for love and distressing selfishness, between great vitality and mortality, between virtue and vice, between enlightened knowledge and deep ignorance, between constructive and destructive tendencies. It's okay. Theology must become a tool of the biasing and a means of obtaining critical information that shapes the right set of beliefs. Um, so uh, human rights is about believing on values and rights and the right way to believe or to believe in perhaps is a function that can be assisted by theology and theologians. And last, uh, human rights must be thought in conjunction with Christian faith and values for a better development. This link must be tested and verified at all times and all cases, not only in theory, but also in practice. Again, the practical empirical dimension should be uh, considered. And yeah, the last one, if you want, just to... I know there's uh, still... Uh, uh, sorry. Well, I leave it uh, if you want to read, and the next one can already be. Thank you, Professor Oviedo. <laughs> With so many issues, our coffee break is already going to be oh, full of discussion. And, oh, and very short. <laughs> uh, and very short, Unfo <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately. But now I'm happy to give the floor to Professor Hans Georg Sieberts from the University of Würzburg in Germany. And the title of the presentation will appear, I think. Or oh, do you have a PPT? Yes. But in the meanwhile, I read it to everybody. So he, uh, Professor Sieberts will present on the theme, what do young people understand by human dignity? Which factors determine it? And is there a connection with human rights? Thank you very much and welcome you here and also people who are uh, following us uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, the title uh, in the flyer is longer uh, and um, contains three research questions. I need 15 minutes for each. So, because I only have 15 minutes in total, I reduce my lecture to only the first question, and I leave out uh, the second and the third, um, which uh, can be uh, published later. So, it remains, what do young people understand by human dignity? And I want to answer this question with uh, the help of empirical data. And I um, take the data from, no, no, back, I give you a sign when uh, this uh, slide is needed. Uh, so uh, I use the data from the data set of this Religion Human Rights project, which was carried out, the second version of this project, between 2012 and 2018. The participating countries agreed in um, uh, having a similar, not the same, but a similar um, sample, that means uh, young people between uh, 16 and 20, uh, mostly. Some, some are younger, some are older, but that was uh, the average. Um, and most of the outcomes uh, of this project have uh, has been published in um, uh, a Springer series, Religion and Human Rights. So what I can deal with is a, a data set of alone 15 countries, because I didn't have all these uh, data sets available now with about 15,000 respondents. Short, a short remark about uh, human dignity and human rights. In practical policy, both the United Nations and the European Union agree that human dignity legitimizes and justifies uh, individual rights. Human dignity seems to express best the fundamental ethical concern to substantiate all claims of humanity comprehensively. Dignity is therefore recognized as a concept that precedes all other rights. However, it should not go unmentioned 
that there is also criticism on the concept of human dignity from both philosophy and law, especially regarding the content and the scope of the concept. We also can mention that Kant, for instance, said that there is no direct line between human dignity and law. This is a nice discussion, philosophical debate, uh, but I cannot follow this debate, but I will mention that there is a debate about this um, narrow connection we uh, often um, see in the literature. In fact, this connection is established by the United Nations in 1966 in its International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And in this covenant, the individual was recognized as a citizen equipped with rights. And for us, it is now in this little research uh, decisive that the concept of human dignity is given a fundamental function by international authorities. What is meant now by um, uh, human dignity? Historically, the dominant understanding of dignity was contingent. According to this view, dignity is regarded as depending on a person's social position or behavior. The loss of social rank or immoral behavior can have the consequence of losing, of, uh, losing uh, the ascribed dignity. However, since the time of enlightenment, latest, an understanding of dignity arose which claimed that dignity should be regarded as something inherent to all human beings by its very nature. And this inherent dignity could not, could never be lost. And it was also Immanuel Kant who has pointed out that human being must never be treated merely as an instrument, but as an end in him or herself. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 uses the term inherent dignity in its preamble, the International Covenant Civil Political Rights 1966 speaks about the fundamental foundational character of human dignity and human dignity is also subject matter of the preamble and article one in the European uh, chapter uh, of fundamental rights and also in some nation state uh, um, uh, constitutions as well uh, in Germany. If the concept of human dignity is seen as a basic of human rights, then empirical research should show that respondents value human dignity as a core concept. However, this should be the concept of inherent dignity and not a contingent understanding as this would contradict the spirit of human rights in our modern understanding. In other words, we should be expected that the contingent understanding of human dignity will be negative and the non-contingent one positive. Hypothetically, different contingent notions of human dignity can correlate with each other, but there should be no correlation between contingent and non-contingent dignity concepts because they too are mutually exclusive. And now the next slide. Operationalization. So if we talk in empirical research about a concept, we have to operationalize the concept, which means we have to indicate what the, do we measure if uh, we use such a concept as dignity. And uh, in this uh, little research, we used uh, a conception of Nordenfeld, who uh, constructed three sub-dimensions of dignity. There is firstly, the human dignity of merit when dignity depends on someone's social position and on society's appreciation of the person in question. Secondly, there is dignity of moral stature when dignity depends on a person's individual achievements or behavior. And the non-contingent meaning of human dignity is defined as inherent dignity, which means that dignity is basically connected with humanity as you see in the next figure, please. Uh, sorry, uh, in this figure, um, in, in the figure we see, the next figure shows uh, for people who are not, please uh, go ahead, uh, people are, who are not so familiar with statistics. When we later see uh, mean values, uh, we have a, a scale of from totally disagree to fully agree. And uh, uh, the number one is totally disagree, uh, fully agree is five. And all values who are below three below to the negative half of the scale and above three to the positive, just for orientation what the next numbers uh, will mean. Now we come to the empirical finding. Next slide, please. Um, 
next slide, please. Yes. So, uh, we are here um, uh, with some illustration. Uh, first, we look at um, human dignity as dignity of merit. And um, uh, we see here that uh, merit is the appreciation. Dignity is if the appreciation is given to a person. And we can be sure that this uh, is given to Asterix, uh, as far I know uh, all these little journals, uh, that uh, his dignity is for sure a um, uh, result um, of the appreciation people, uh, of his, uh, people give to him. Uh, if we now uh, look uh, at um, uh, this uh, slide, we see that, uh, uh, do we miss another slide? If you go back, no, not forward, back. There should be, oh, well, okay. Well, go back one, uh, so I, just to mention, because I have explained uh, the value, so you see dignity of merit has, uh, for all these respondents, the mean value of 2.68, which is in the negative half of the scale. But you see that uh, moral stature, uh, so that means uh, dignity is dependent uh, from the moral behavior of a person, is valued higher than the, what we call inherent dignity. So both are positive in the positive half, but uh, a moral stature, honor to be given to a person depends on his moral behavior is 3.70, is here valued uh, the highest. So, but now we uh, go into detail of the three uh, concepts and a closer look now, uh, next slide, a closer look now to uh, uh, the dignity of merit. Uh, we see that um, uh, the overall value of all respondents was in the negative half, but uh, looking to the uh, percentages, we see that uh, in total 48%, so nearly, nearly, nearly half uh, of our sample uh, says totally uh, disagree and uh, disagree, but that means 20% uh, uh, and another 30% are not negative, and at least 30% who agree or agree fully that dignity should be something related uh, to the appreciation, appreciation uh, given to a person uh, by others. What about the next concept, the second concept, uh, moral uh, behavior? About 9,700 students are convinced that dignity is dependent to the moral behavior of a person. Only 2,100 reject this uh, opinion, which means uh, rejection is uh, 13 or nearly 14 percent, but nearly two-thirds uh, say yes, this should be or this is uh, an indicator for human dignity. And finally, um, the uh, uh, inherent dignity, and inherent means to all people, and that is in asterisk terminology, including the Romans. And because uh, we are in Rome, I thought I should mention that explicitly. So, dignity to all people, including the Romans. Um, <laughs> And uh, here we see that uh, only 20% disagree, 55% agree, agree strongly, which is a bit less than uh, moral behavior. Um, there is a, a medium correlation between um, dignity of merit, dignity of moral stature, and no correlation between both and uh, dignity of inherent dignity, which was uh, also our expectation. Now let us move uh, to uh, uh, differences between the countries. Next slide. Again, uh, um, uh, appreciation uh, as a basic of dignity. As stated above, the data are from 15 countries and the national culture seems to be important. That use from Moldova, India, Tanzania, Nigeria are most positive regarding dignity of merit. Good result from the experience in societies that appreciation matters. I'm not familiar with all these countries, but this is a question. So that is, uh, when I try to interpret it, uh, it, it would be my assumption that, um, that uh, the ex societal experience matters, especially use from Western Europe, European countries, uh, you see on the right side, is much more critical, or they are more negative uh, um, on the, in the left uh, columns. 
The next slide for moral behavior, so moral stature, moral behavior as a criterion for dignity is appreciated by use in India, Tanzania, and Nigeria, and it is slightly accepted from use uh, from seven other states, while use from five countries are ambivalent. No country has an average value in the negative half of the scale. Again, this concept seems to get the strongest support from all of them. And finally, uh, what we call the um, inherent dignity, the strongest cohesion can found in this concept because uh, only respondents from six countries are ambivalent positive and the rest are very positive. So we only find Romania in the negative half and I have no explanation for it. Um, Conclusion, it can be summarized that the empirical picture is by no means as clear as official documents suggest. The idea, that, the idea that all people, regardless of the degree of social attribution and regardless of their practical behavior, are equal in the sense that they have the same dignity simply of being humans, does not characterize the mindset of all respondents. One can ask whether this finding is a result of an unsatisfactory education, but such a monocausal explanation is open to doubt. First of all, it uh, must be conceded that it is difficult to recognize the same dignity for all people if this is to apply to a mass murder as well as to a personal person of moral integrity, let us say a brave monk in his monastery. Should a person's behavior not be relevant in regard to this, his or her dignity? Many would say, yes, it should be relevant. And the opposite thinking is contrary to the inner moral compass, that it should not be relevant. So the inner moral compass tells them it should be relevant. Um, it cannot be, many will think, that a person who harms other people have the same dignity than the harmed person itself. The reasoning is not only a problem for young people, but we know it also from adults. For them, it is not easy to affirm inherent dignity when considering the critical cases that exist in real life. Secondly, we do not find an overwhelming support for the concept of inherent dignity, and this could be a result of the very abstract level of this concept. My guess is that it is caused by the experience in everyday life. In some countries more, in some countries less, where respondents experience that special honor is apparently bestowed to, on those who appear to behave with moral, moral integrity. If young people observe, for instance, appreciation given by others seems to correlate with dignity, this observation will shape their understanding of dignity because that is how socialization works. Because so the result of socialization never can be satisfying, can never be satisfying, uh, education and training is necessary. Maybe, and this is a final, uh, final thought, maybe the results uh, can make us thinking about a differentiation of the concept of dignity which is in many cases used as a container concept. Container concept means you can put in a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas. Maybe the results here stimulate to think about dignity for everyone in terms of equality of all people in front of the law, while, to speak with Charles Taylor, recognition as an alternative or an addition to uh, equality, recognition must be earned. The terrorist of, or murderer cannot expect recognition. The people who behave not properly cannot expect the same uh, recognition uh, than other people who do. And this could be the empirical message of uh, the appreciation, appreciation of moral behavior. And uh, if we follow this idea and try uh, to open this container of human dignity and uh, to define more clearly about which indicators we really speak and not in general about human dignity, for instance, by using uh, the distinction between uh, equal law and uh, recognition, uh, maybe that can help us a step further as one 
idea how to deal with empirical data, but there are for sure other possibilities uh, to make conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, and with the, also the concept of human dignity that is in this two presentation, we understand how relevant and for public theology are these themes, both in public discussions and within the church. Let's not forget that a recent uh, declaration of uh, the dicastery of the Congregation of the Faith was on human dignity. So. This is uh, very well discussed, both within and outside the church. On this theme, uh, also, uh, prof I give the floor to Professor Chris Hermans from the Radboud University in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, on social imagination of human rights, religion serving human dignity. Thank you. Thank you. There's a good planning on speakers on this conference because I will be very critical on the concept of human dignity, especially in terms of inherent... Right, okay. The, the idea of human dignity has become a central organizing principle in the promotion and advancement, you can give the first slide, advancement of universal human rights. The Universal Declaration Preamble opens with the words, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable in Inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Now, to give a summary of Catholic social traditions, EST, the idea of human dignity is one of the core principles, social encyclicals, encyclicals, papal addresses, and letters offer a powerful articulation of dignity as a foundational social principle. In summary, the emphasis is on corporate and personalist aspect of dignity. Second, on the intrinsic moral basis for teaching on dignity. And third, the inherently social nature, a society extending to all creator creatorly life of any claim of dignity. Next slide. Now, despite this increased intention, is this, this the critique? Yes. Despite this increased attention of human dignity in secular and theological debate, we observe at the same time that the concept of human dignity is highly contested. Now, we mention here four points of critique in literature. There's more, but I think this is a good summary. It is criticized as an idea that lacks a single core meaning and whose vagueness leads either to a social idea with no real bite or to an idea which ends up as being filled up and co-opted by a range of potentially troubling ideological positions. Second, questions are also raised about the extent to which dignity can function as a universal, trans-contextual principle. In the first instance, this concern relates to differences in cultural norms and fundamental world view. And they correlate with that understanding of what dignity is. Thirdly, <coughs> other scholars argue that the features of dignity, quote, are so well aligned with other applications of another concept that dignity is in fact a reducible to that concept. And one of the most strong examples of the reductionist positions is the claim that dignity is nothing else than the autonomy because, quote, it amounts to troubling, to treating people in the way that they want to be treated. So it's a superfluous concept. It's, at the end, it's the same as autonomy. Finally, I'd like to mention the critique on what is called the essentialist approach of human dignity. That's, that's something that typically found in that wording of intrinsic, an essentialist approach of dignity, which define a fundamental core of human dignity. Now, a well-known example is that I did that dignity has a minimum core in the recognition of an intrinsic word 
which every human being possesses. Without further explanation on what types of treatment violate intrinsic worth. This essentialist conception of dignity does not give sufficient guidance to address the complexities of actual cases. Okay, that's about my critique. Next slide, please. Please bring something. New directions. That's where we go to. Um, in line of this critique, we need to address the question of dignity from a different perspective than searching for the foundation of the concept of dignity. Now, I will present three directions in reformulating the approach of human dignity in research, and I will call them the moral excellent approach. That's why he has so high results on the moral status of that uh, uh, dignity. The capability approach, and the third one is the resilience reproach. Now the philosopher Michael Rosen proposes that we should ask the question, so it's asking different questions in order to tap in what is the meaning of dignity. So we should ask the question, why is the idea of dig dignity so deeply morally entrenched? Now, dignity remains something of a philosophical mystery, but keeps us focused on the moral significance of being human and human beings. The answer that we will find remain incomplete, tentative, because history is open and incomplete. And because the history of dignity requires us to lose ourselves in the complexities of the conditions of life and the ambiguities of neighbor love. To ask the dignity question is to do something that is implicitly necessary to our nature, our human nature, and to the excellence for which human beings are made. We need, that's an example, we need to study spaces in which we talk about our commitments and responsibilities in relations of love, loss and friendship which enable us to give content to that idea of dignity. So that's the first approach, a moral excellence approach. Second direction is given in the question, what are people actually capable to do and to be? And what real opportunities are available to them? Now this line of thinking is represented by Martha Nussbaum and the so-called capability approach, but those are familiar with uh, the work of Hannah Arendt uh, and uh, Paul Ricoeur, also recognizes specifically in the late um, Ricoeur this, this same capability approach. Now the capabilities approach can be provisionally defined as an approach to comparative quality of life assessment and to theorizing about basic social justice. Social, political, familial and economic conditions may prevent people from choosing to function in accordance with the developed internal capability and opportunities of the political, social and economical environment. If I will come to it, I will give an example of a student which is supervised by Carl and me and who has a, a kind of this type of approach. The third direction, to ask a different question, is found in the book Fallible Man of Paul Ricoeur. Now the core question here is, what processes of resilience, human resilience, keep alive in human actions with and for others in just institution, the focus on human dignity? So what processes of resilience keep alive the focus of human dignity, on human dignity? Now, human, in human beings, there's a disproportionality between the infinite possibility. Ricoeur calls that the ethical grandeur of human beings. The infinite possibility of human dignity and the limitations of our character. We can fall short in our openness, 
to human dignity. My character and my humanity, it's a quote from Ricoeur, together make up my freedom, make of my freedom an unlimited possibility so I can treat an other according to human dignity. I can do it. And the constituted partiality, I can maybe not choose towards that human dignity and fall back in egoism or whatever. The synthesis of our character, limitation, and the human dignity of the other as unlimited may not come about. But sometimes it does and sometimes it don't. This is why human beings are in need of processes of resilience that connect experiences of the self to the good in life events. That is, to new beginnings of the good life with and for others and just on institutions and in a societal, sustainable society. Next slide. So my proposal is to ask different questions in order to, to avoid for that concept of inherent dignity and to focus on what is meant with that concept of human dignity. Now, so how to research human dignity empirically and, and in, in connection to human right? Um, so I propose three alternative directions to formulate research questions in studying human dignity and public theology. I just read them. What moral commitments and responsibilities appear in relations of love, loss, and friendship, which enable us to give content to that idea of dignity? So it's, it's to try to tap that more understanding of people of moral excellence. And, 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 and to avoid any abstract formulations of inherent, which doesn't measure anything. Second one, what are people actually capable to do and to be? And in that capability, what real opportunities are available for them? It's not only capability, but it's also social, economical opportunities. And thirdly, what process of resilience, new beginnings, keep in life, keep alive in human actions, with and for others institutions, the focus on human dignity? Next slide, please. Next is the question, what is then the object of... Yes, it's a good slide. What is the object of empirical research in public theology when we study human dignity and human rights. Now, dignity and rights refer to what I will call a different type of imagination. And that's important. Where human rights are promoted and protected by national institutions, so if you hear human rights, you must hear institutions, human institutions. Human dignity is found in cultural imagination, cultural values, and cultural identity. It's about purpose. It's, it's the same as the, the concept of freedom compared to uh, uh, the constitutional democracy. Democracy is something about institutions, and freedom is something on the purpose of that democracy how we live together. I introduce here a, a distinction between cultural imagination and social imagination based on the book Unimaginable, a book at 2018 from the Anglican theologian Graham Ward. Why? Why? I think his theory is fit to deal with the enigma of human dignity the enigma of human dignity. According to Ward, the human condition makes it necessary for humans, or human beings, to confront the unbelievable and unimaginable. Imagination of the unimaginable is for Ward intrinsic to the way humans perceive the visible. So when we perceive the, perceive the visible, we cannot but also perceive the unimaginable. 
Secondly, war distinguishes between cultural imagination and social imagination, which is relevant with regard to the imagination of human dignity, cultural imagination, and human rights, as indicated above, as social imagination. I give, I explain it, it I think it's the next slide. Yes, we're almost at the end. Cultural imagination is the activation of that vast deposit of possibilities stored in images, myths, figures, and past ways of living. In cultural imagination lies all the possibilities for the way we live or might live, act or might act socially. Cultural imagination generates cultural values and ethos and is connected with cultural and religious capital. Now, social imagination, that's important to, to see the difference, reflects the ways we institutionalize and organize our imagination of social practices, relations, and the establishment of institutional institutions. So it's, it's about the way we institutionalize our social world. Institutions provide structures that support and enable the agency of actors, but simultaneously limit, limit their freedom by control over their members. Not every possibility or com for, for combination and change in the social imagination is activated at any given time. The the, due to the contingency of circumstance and context. Last slide, please. I end with an example of the role of religious capital to study as religious animation. Carl and I, we supervise a student uh, from Nigeria who's doing a, a research on poverty and, and, and the social and, the, and, and how people deal with that. Now, religious capital can be studied as cultural imagination of human dignity, which inspire religious people to reflect critical on social imagination of the human rights in society. An example is one research student in naming father Charles a yogi from Nigeria, who asked different groups of, of church members of different parishes to give examples of religious stories which inspire them about God's future for living in poverty. He analyzed the explanations of the respondents in view of the idea of human dignity. So people tell stories and that stories relate for them to human life. And then he tries to understand that inspiration using the concept of human dignity in the Catholic social tradition. By looking to the present situation from the perspective of God's promise, the respondents give insights in their imagination of human dignity. While at the same time, they speak about the social imagination of, oh, sorry, about the social imagination of the social economic conditions, which are influenced by the institution of the state, whose opportunities hinder their uh, 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 life of a good future and to live in human dignity. I think it's a good example of empirical public theology serving human dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot also for this presentation. We'll make our break more interesting for discussions. And uh, so I give the floor to the last presenter before the break, Professor Alexander Unza from the TU Dortmund University in Germany. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's technical university, not theological university, <laughs> I uh, have to confess. So. Yeah, as you can see here on the screen, uh, I want to talk about uh, at least three concepts, religion, human rights, and democracy, and um, their interrelation. And I thought it would be necessary that I start with giving some background information why I am interested in this interplay. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, 
at the beginning some background information here. What you can see here uh, are uh, pictures from this uh, religion and human rights project that was mentioned several times now at different uh, lectures. And I had the privilege to, to work in this research group for seven years under the supervision of uh, Professor Zibetz and we were able to collaborate with uh, Professor Anthony. you probably find him if you look quite carefully on one of the pictures. And um, what are the main results from this research for me are uh, the following two. The first one was that there was a high, uh, no, uh, stick to, to the picture, give them a chance to, to find you. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll tell you when, when to change, yeah. So the, the first main finding for me was that there is a high appreciation among young people for human rights in any respect uh, for maybe two uh, exceptions and uh, this was uh, especially when it comes to the right to life, uh, questions of abortion and so on and uh, um, rights that are related to sexual ethics. So this, this was the first one. And the second one was that uh, religion, individual religiosity, in most cases played not a major role when it comes to the question of do young people accept human rights or do they reject human rights? So human rights seem to be, uh, at least in the way that we researched it, uh, highly acceptable uh, among different people. Um, when we continued our uh, discussions in these research groups, I think it was after three or four years, uh, a new topic entered our discussion. And this was mainly brought up by colleagues from the Southern Hemisphere and from, from Eastern Europe. Uh, it was the question, okay, what does these results mean for our societies? Yeah? So it's interesting to, to ask people whether they agree with uh, certain aspects of human rights, but in, in our countries, human rights are under threat. And should we not better talk about um, questions of democracy, of citizenship, and so on? So this was something that, uh, yeah, um, yeah, remained in my mind, and we had uh, conversations at uh, the end of uh, this project uh, whether citizenship would not be uh, a topic that is worth to research. And when I then changed to Dortmund, and now I uh, ask for the next slide. Uh, I was able to uh, get funding from our Federal Ministry of Education and Research for a European network uh, on religion and citizenship, yeah? mainly in the field of education, because my field of specialization is religious education. And in this network, uh, we discussed now for uh, two years the intersection between religious education on the one hand side and citizenship education on the other side. Yeah? You see there we have now uh, established a network of around 20 uh, countries with colleagues from different disciplines. In the first year we, have, we had a workshop there and um, discussed what are the urgent topics in the intersection of religious education and citizenship education. Yeah? And, in my mind, there was questions like, okay, how can we give uh, students knowledge? How can we foster skills among them, attitudes, yeah, that, so that they agree uh, with the rule of law and so on and so on. But after three days, we learned from, from several co uh, colleagues that another topic is much more important for them, and this is the question of belonging. Um, Belonging in the sense of whether democratic societies, whether our uh, societies are open in a way that people from, from different religious and non-religious backgrounds are um, yeah, welcomed there and feel uh, as equal members of this society and can rejoin um, these uh, democratic processes with their own backgrounds. And we then, I would ask for the next slide, um, looked for uh, a concept that is mainly used in uh, human geography, which is sense of belonging, and uh, I just want to give you a short uh, definition of this concept, uh, mainly as uh, elaborated by Marco Antonsich and Nira Ewell Davis, who are uh, the main figures in this discussion. Uh, they write in their uh, publications, a sense of belonging refers to a personal and intimate feeling of being at home in a place as well as feeling safe, emphasizing comfort, familiarity, and security rather than a physical location. 
this concept, and this is uh, uh, discussed in uh, all these papers, is closely tied to rootedness or identity as uh, other concepts. And it mainly involves um, emotional investment and desires for attachment, probably as pre expressed through practices like rituals and routines. So people can have different belongings, yeah? and uh, people who identify themselves as religious persons uh, probably uh, put a special emphasis on their religious identity and their religious belonging to a certain community. And our question was, um, what happens if there is probably a kind of conflict between belonging to a religious community on the one hand side and belonging to um, a democratic society where rules are uh, in charge that uh, yeah, in conflict with uh, certain religious teachings and so on. Yeah? And to find the connection now to the human rights discussion, yeah, human rights are often proposed as a kind of overlapping consensus, human dignity as a concept, yeah, where people from different cultural and religious backgrounds can enter the discussion and uh, can, uh, can join this international community and to, um, yeah, um, to interact with each other on uh, an equal footing. On the other side, there is also um, this discussion uh, that challenges uh, the universal claim of human rights, seeing this concept as a hegemonic concept, yeah, mo mostly established in Western societies, uh, which are not compatible with, uh, for example, traditions in other parts of the world. So this is a bit the background of um, the title of my concept because I was interested in um, the way young people see this interconnection between their own religious belonging, the democratic society in which they live, and uh, the concept of human rights. Next slide, please. So now um, a bit of information about the data I used. Um, I rely in um, this lecture on data from uh, the ICCS, the International Citizenship and Civic Education Survey. Uh, maybe you know PISA, yeah? So what PISA is for uh, education in uh, language and mathematics, ICCS is the equivalent in uh, political education or uh, citizenship education international survey. Um, most of these surveys do not really care for religion, and uh, thank God um, the ICCS does. Also, I would say, as a theologian, um, there is all uh, those space for improvement. Yeah, so th this is very limited. What what they ask people about religion and uh, the religiosity. We will see this in a minute uh, when it comes to uh, the operationalization of the concepts. Next slide, please. So this is my conceptual model. You can see on the left uh, upper side um, two items that are related to religious belonging. Uh, it is on the one hand side attending religious services, which refers mainly to um, the um, yeah, communal dimension, the social dimension of religion, I would say, and then on a more individual level, religion as a moral resource. I show you in a minute what is behind these concepts. Then on the upper side, uh, right hand side, uh, human rights as a framework in the EU. So whether people uh, recognize that EU is uh, making a kind of policy that favors human rights. And on uh, the lower side, I put in uh, two concepts that um, yeah, show this belonging maybe to democracy and to, to the society where people live. Political trust is a very common concept uh, Do I uh, in the political sciences. Do I trust the political institutions, the parliament, the government, that they behave in the way uh, they do? So um, a value judgment about this. And now for me as a German, uh, a bit problematic concept, I would say, because of our history. Uh, but in other countries, maybe not uh, that problematic patriotism, so um, that people feel proud of their country, yeah? so that they are uh, in favor of this and uh, really like to, to be there and feel accepted there. So these are the four concepts, and you see the arrows here, which uh, show a bit uh, the theoretical links between the different concepts that uh, I, I draw. Uh, I must say that I did the analysis only for Germany because otherwise it would be too complicated to, to show here. And in Germany, um, the data set uh, allows to distinguish between three different groups. The Christians on the one hand side, 
Uh, it's a pity that there is no possibility in the data set to distinguish between Catholics and Protestants. Um, the Muslims, which is uh, the, the second largest uh, religious group in Germany, and uh, those who have non, no affiliation. Here you can see the instruments that are behind um, these concepts. And next slide, please. Some information about um, statistics that I applied. Uh, I worked with the structural uh, equation modeling, uh, performed a multi-group analysis so that we can see differences between these three different groups. And uh, before that, I checked for measurement invariance, which basically means Patriotism, when I ask, for example, Muslims who have a uh, migration background in, in Germany, coming from Turkey or from, from other places, maybe patriotism means something different than if I ask a person from Bavaria who lives there uh, for thousands of generations. Yeah? So just to check that we measure the same things and we did this here. Okay, results. Um, so this is the structural equation model for um, the Christians, what you can see here. Religion as a moral resource was not connected to any of uh, the other concepts. And then you can see attending religious services is weakly connected to uh, the observance that uh, the U uh, applies a framework that favors human rights and also weakly connected to, to political trust. There is uh, a stronger connection between um, the human rights perception and uh, political trust and both uh, the human rights idea and uh, political trust contribute to, to patriotism. Next slide, please. Um, maybe as expected, we have no um, connection between any religious measurement uh, and other concepts among uh, the non-affiliated because they identify themselves as non-religious, so it, it's not that surprising. Um, for them, only connections between this human rights idea and political trust and patriotism can be found. And then, for me, the, maybe the most interesting um, case is uh, the next slide, the Muslims. Here we found uh, religious, uh, religion as a moral resource connected to the idea that the EU is a, um, yeah, a political framework that, that fosters human rights. And we have here a remarkable um, yeah, influence, uh, beta value. Then we have here Another connection from the human rights idea to political trust, even stronger, and uh, the last one to, to patriotism. Yeah? So even here, uh, we have indirect effects coming from uh, religious uh, belonging, religious identity, among the idea of human rights to acceptance of democracy to patriotism. Next slide, please. Two more slides with um, discussions. Um, what I found interesting in these um, uh, in, in these data, I just can uh, uh, point out three. Yeah? So the first thing is we find different associations among the three different non-religious groups. So uh, it is necessary that when we talk about these issues, that we look very carefully. Uh, how this applies to uh, different social groups and religious groups that we have in, in our uh, society. Yeah? The, um, uh, the concept of contextualization that uh, was already mentioned by Chris Hermans um, is especially important for me as an empirical theologian to understand what does this mean for people living in a certain place in a certain society. What I found interesting as well only positive associations were found between these concepts. So there is not, maybe there is this stereotype, uh, at least in the German society, yeah, that uh, Muslim people do not accept uh, the idea of human rights because it's against their uh, religious traditions. Even here, where um, the individual religiosity, the uh, moral thing was, was so important, there was a positive connection and also to, to the other concepts. And uh, also what we could found here, uh, not direct associations between religious belonging and patriotism, which can be an indicator maybe for a feeling of belonging to a society, but this is mediated via this political legal ideas of a working democracy, of a human rights framework, which guarantees that we can all live together in plurality. Next slide, last slide. Um, some limitations. 
Of course, as I said before, um, the instruments are very limited, especially when it comes to uh, measurement of religion and religiosity. Uh, we only had a small number of nuns and Muslims compared to the Christians, so we had about 800 Christians in the sample and only 150 nuns and Muslims. So um, maybe things would change if we could, could research a, a greater number of, uh, of these groups. And also, this is just valid now for the German sample, and I would be very interested in compare this with uh, situations in, in other countries. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> and many thanks to all speakers, because only with two minutes of delay, we're going to the break, so I guess for stretching our legs. And uh, 1645, we start again here for the second round. Thank you so much.
Practically anomalies, actually. But this is a good example. <laughs> Even the moderator. For fear of the moderator. Oh, for fear of the moderator. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what my students know very well. Uh, th so, thank you for being back. And I give the floor immediately to Professor Karl Sterkens from Radboud University in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, with the theme, The Major Threat for Economic Rights, Theological Reflections on Greed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. In the Human Rights Research Project, we have jointly observed that socio-economic human rights, those of the second generation, can count on less attention than civil rights, political rights, judicial rights, and nowadays also ecological rights and emancipatory rights of groups. They seem to be somewhat neglected, both theoretically and practically, although reflections on humanity and dignity are obviously widely present, and quality of life has also pecuniary aspects, economic standards. In publications, Francis Vincent Anthony has reflected on this shortcoming from a historical perspective, but even more so from philosophical and cultural perspectives. For instance, by looking at the cultural phenomena of caste and class and other things. Today, I would like to take a strictly individual viewpoint and look at the reasons why people always seem to want more. And what Christianity in particular has to say about these reasons. This 15 minutes reflection in honor of Francis Vincent is about the characteristics of greed and the beliefs that Christianity carries to try to overcome it. For greedy people, even a lot is not enough. They want more than others have or more than they already had. These are two desires that do not necessarily coincide, but neither are they mutually exclusive. In the first case, wanting more than others, greed is accompanied by inequality. And in the second case, wanting more than what you already have it is related to increasing wealth. Inequality and wealth are also not included together, but one senses immediately that they might be related in some way. It is indeed undesirable that as many people as possible to be rich. And the challenge is to achieve this without poor people. Greed, Latin, avaritia or cupiditati, uh, Latin, Averitio, Cupiditati, Pleonexia and Greek. Greed stands in the way of that ideal. That is not to say that all inequality and all wealth, and therefore all poverty in this world, are the result of the greed of the individual or the collective. But one can argue the other way around. By definition, greed has problematic aspects, because from its perspective, the acquisition of property is not reasonably focused on one's own needs and well-being, but excessive and insatiable. The greedy pursuit of grain also harms other individuals or society as a whole, and it is therefore contrary to the principles of charity and justice. And finally, greed wrongly places the temporal above the eternal, the particular above the comprehensive, superficiality above depth, and the earthly above the divine, the last symbol of what is ultimate to us. These three characteristics of one, excess, two, harmfulness, and three, wickedness or godlessness, impiety, these three characteristics make greed a sin, at least according to Thomas Aquinas and also the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This description of greed already shows what is wrong with wanting to have limitless more. I would like to look at why we nevertheless want more. Greed can refer to services, goods and money, but traditionally it mainly concerns money, because its amount clearly cannot relate indefinitely to one's own needs or well-being. 
Collecting material things still sounds acceptable if it is the expression of a special interest or a relaxing activity, even if it is much of the same thing. But collecting money, as in a collection, rather sounds like a joke, unless it concerns numismatics. And that is because anyone who, was, who has money actually has nothing. While money has the potential to be exchanged for other things, in itself it takes a lot of faith to value money. At least it presupposes the belief that others believe that money is worth something else and that they will continue to believe so. It is therefore rather unreasonable to want more and more of it. And that contradiction with reason also partly contains its sinfulness. The sinfulness of the sin is mainly its unreasonableness. Again, Thomas. To justify greed, some creative argumentation is therefore necessary. We do so by saying it is not about the money, but about the principle behind it, a reason to be extra careful when somebody says it. Greed can be disguised by seeing it as a result or an expression of another principle. Apart from simply consumerism, I would say there are five reasons to want more. Autonomy, security, dignity and status, and taking comfort in money. I start with autonomy. The freedom and the ability to make our own decisions is probably the most common motive for wanting more. Indeed, empirical studies using data from all continents have repeatedly shown that greater autonomy is associated with greater well-being and that wealth has an indirect influence on well-being through its effect on autonomy. These findings are consistent for rich and economically less developed countries, as well as for countries that score differently on individualistic versus collectivistic orientation. Especially in countries with lower levels of prosperity, there is an unmediated relationship between wealth and happiness. But that relationship is curvilinear because the effect of income decreases once the saturation point is reached. Money does not make you immediately happy, but the lack of it makes you unhappy. To the extent that autonomy for well-being is a driving force for enrichment, the latter does not meet the criteria of greed. In that case, the enrichment is not a goal in itself, but aimed at personal well-being. Money for the sake of autonomy can even come across as cleverly thought out, while money for the sake of just having it remains shamefully suspect. Now, one could argue oh, one could counter-argue that autonomy can also be the result of detachment, because a simple lifestyle, if freely chosen, is a source of strength. But the condition of free choice in salvation through simplicity reveals already the weakness of poverty. After all, making your decisions based on fate is not a very convincing choice. This applies to the celibitarian with little, with little sex appeal. It applies to the... I do not look at any particular... Yeah. So, so, so after all, making decisions based on fate is not very convincing. This applies to the celibitarian with little sex appeal. It applies to the person without an opinion who promises obedience. And probably, probably it is also true for the classic third religious vow the vow of poverty. The vow of poverty, which only became more widespread with the rise of the mendicant orders in the 13th century, therefore presupposes voluntariness. Only under this condition, it provides the freedom and the credibility to serve and inspire others. In individual lives, the vow of poverty has undoubtedly led to painful dependence at times. But this does not detract from the evangelical advice that detachment offers perspectives for living your life free and independently. But detachment is only possible if there is something to detach from. And that paradoxically makes it better possible, but more difficult 
for the rich to be detached than for the poor. Mark chapter 10. Possession is therefore certainly an ambiguous and double-edged sword in relation to personal autonomy. The fundamental rebuttal of the religious language game is, however, not about whether autonomy is achieved through surplus or through simplicity, but about the extent to which human autonomy, autonomy can be realized in any case. That issue is related to the basic core of most forms of religiosity, namely the belief that there is something outside ourselves that transcend, transcends us and is even greater than the universe. Of course, awareness of transcendence does not necessarily lead to the statement that human autonomy is total illusory, although it has been claimed as well. However, the decentering of man does lead at least to a certain problematization of his autonomy. Can we make laws? Can we make all laws for ourselves? Auto nomos. In what circumstances may human will be law? And is the human will free? In Christian theology, there are no clear answers to these questions. In fact, how and to what extent autonomy is limited is an important recurring theological point of contention. A well-known example is the dispute between Luther and Erasmus about the relationship between grace and free will, the theoretical core theme of the Reformation. Based on the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, Erasmus argues that Luther's views on the predestination of events and human dependence on grace to do good leave insufficient room for human initiative. By distinguishing between natural, cooperative and consumatory grace, Erasmus gives more freedom and autonomy to mankind while retaining a certain dependence on God for the progress and the completion of the human path of salvation. Again and again, compromises have been sought between absolute autonomy and complete heteronomy in order to keep the human need for assertion bearable for each other and for society. Admittedly, the relativization of human autonomy can produce both good and less good results with ethical dilemmas. But in dealing with poverty and inequality, the attempt to reconcile autonomy of earthly reality with the transcendence of salvation mainly entails a call. And I quote the ordaining bishop of Francis Vincent Anthony, John Paul II, in this context. Any person is alienated if he or she refuses to transcend himself and to live the experience of self-giving and to live and form an authentic human community oriented towards the final destiny, which is God. A society is alienated if its forms of social organization, production and consumption make it more difficult to offer this gift of self and to establish this solidarity between people. Centesimus Annus number 41. And just like for autonomy, there are other non-material reasons for greed. The Christian tradition reflects on them and tries to overcome them. The reasons are, as said, security for the future, to have dignity and status, and taking comfort in money. For time, I cannot reflect on the four others, but I would like to say, I still have two minutes, something about dignity and status. Dignity concerns sovereignty. It concerns the inalienable capacity to act, as well as the right to be treated fairly and respectfully. But although dignity is declared inalienable and inherent, she is often lost. The dignity of the poor is also threatened more often than that of the rich, which in itself is a good reason for not wanting to be poor. The Asian Human Rights Charter of 1998 sorry, in Article 2 makes it even sound like a rule. A life in dignity is impossible in the midst of poverty. And that brings us seamlessly to the elitist sister of dignity, of which we accept that there is a difference, and that is status. In reality, dignity and status, social prestige, at least dignity of merit, in your words, are related with possession. And this strange and even amazing connection between dignity and status on the one hand and richness on the other hand 
can be explained by how the human psyche operates and the current structure of social organization. When it comes to the human mind, we are more likely to attribute people's positions to dispositional and individual factors rather than to situation and context. We personalize our observations rather quickly without looking at function or circumstance. And this fundamental attribution error known from psychology is recognizable in the predominant attribution of financial success to personal achievement in combination with limited attribution to environmental factors and luck. And something similar happens with the attribution of poverty. Here, the negative characteristics of the poor rather than bad luck or coincidental aspects predominate with all the consequences we have for attitudes towards poverty. And subsequently, the current social context reinforces these one-sided and often incorrect interpretations. In an aristocratic or an oligarchic society, where power is determined by descent or belonging to a privileged class, personal sympathy with the disadvantaged is no more than a standard of decency. Noblesse oblige, like they say in French. In the context of rigid power relations, poverty is literally miserable because the options for escaping it are limited. But in our meritocratic society, where one's position is assumed to be determined by merit, the loser can expect little understanding. The meritocratic society has for sure enabled social mobility, but, individual, but at individual level it runs the risk to show greater harshness towards those who do not make social progress. And here too, the social teaching of the church has contributed. I thank Professor Anthony for his strong commitment to the spiritual, but especially to the intellectual dimensions of what is generally called the Christian revolution, revelation, with authentic openness towards what other religious and cultural traditions have contributed to all these puzzles. Thank you very much, Professor Sterkens, and I give the floor to Professor, Professor Ulrich Riegel from the University of Siegen in Germany for his presentation on the empirical approach to the right of freedom to religion measuring Muslim religiosity. Thank you, Professor Riegel. Hey. Hello to everybody and please accept my invitation to switch your attention from considerations uh, related on the meaning of human rights and dignity, all that stuff, to measuring, so to the more technical aspects of empirical theology. The human right of freedom of religion commonly is known as uh, the claim not to discriminate a person because of her or his religiosity. And my question in that talk will be, are we as empirical theologians prepared to meet that claim when we address our participants and when we ask them about their religiosity? So do we as uh, empirical theologians have the measures to assess the plurality of religiosities accordingly? In a best of all worlds, some slides should be on the screen right now. Yeah, it's, it's like with, uh, with God's kingdom, it's coming. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, that's a difference. Or, or, yeah, not, not, not a perfect difference because Lord's kingdom is there too, but not perfectly, as I got it. So, my question is, uh, could be living halal, which refers to uh, Muslim religiosity, be an alternative measure? measure of religiosity and that's my test case because if you check all the measures we have on uh, being religious on religiosity you will more or less have a western a protestant bias in it for instance if you think about the francis attitude scales towards christianity theism uh, 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 islam or hinduism it's all about attitude. It's all about the, the correct thinking in regard to these religious traditions. And if you turn to the centrality of religiosity scale of Stefan Huber, for instance, it's all about experience. It's about uh, correct uh, life. And there's some practical inclination in it, but it's all about religious rituals. 
This meets very much a type of religiosity which in the sociology of uh, religion is called the orthodox type of religiosity. And as a theologian, you have to be careful because it's not about the uh, theological concept of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy in uh, the sociology of religion is about uh, believing the correct things and religions that are orthodox in that way, they work like the rational. If you believe in the correct things, you will act out accordingly. So first comes correct belief and all the rest will come by itself. Orthopractic religions, on the other side, they are more about doing the correct things and they are positive. If you do the correct thing, after a while you, you will think correctly. So first is practice and then is belief and that's the other practic idea of being religious. And if we check the various religions, I would say, yeah, the Protestant, re uh, the Protestant, yeah, the Lutheran the reading of uh, Christianity, that's really uh, orthodox. Whereas the Roman Catholic reading is more orthopractic and also the Muslim reading uh, of religion is more orthopractic. And uh, so when I check all these scales, I haven't found uh, a scale that is very much related to an orthopractic approach to religion. And so we tried uh, to, to check whether we can measure religiosity and we needed the test case and our test case was uh, living halal. Because living halal is what uh, Charles Glock would uh, call the consequential dimension of religiosity. So it's uh, orthopractic in its very nature. And if you look at uh, the, the studies uh, that are available, of course, they check for halal sometimes, but they do not take halal as a uh, substitute of religiosity. And normally you have just one item. And so if you have just one item, theoretically you say uh, halal is, there are no sub-dimensions. Halal is a, a single term in itself and everything is halal. But as an empirical theologian, I would say, how do I know if I don't test it? So it was our idea to, to develop a test of living halal and uh, to, uh, to look whether it works out well. That's the instrument uh, we developed and uh, let me just uh, lead you a little bit through the instruments. Uh, if you check the dimensions, you have four different dimensions. It's uh, having halal food, halal medicine, halal doctors, psychologists and halal cosmetics. If you go into um, Muslim literature, these are four dominant uh, uh, tasks or dominant topics when uh, where halal, being halal, what is halal or the divide between halal and haram is discussed. So we said perhaps that could be a good measure to, to check whether halal is a, a single concept that covering all the field or whether Muslims distinguish you could look for halal food, but you have no idea whether you uh, buy uh, halal cosmetics or not. So uh, that's the test case. Then we distinguish between the availability of such products and the importance, particularly in a Western context that is not deeply, the culture is not deeply Muslim. The availability is perhaps something different than uh, the importance you ascribe to something. You can think uh, it's very important to have halal cosmetics, but there's no shop around. So there could be a, a distinction between. And the third thing is we didn't want to say the, the participants what is halal. So we had uh, item wordings that refer to halal, but it's up to the participants to decide by themselves what they understand as halal. And, and that's important because if you check the, uh, the Muslim literature, there's no consensus what is halal and what is haram. There's some uh, distinction between that. So we said, why should we take over a particular position, let the people uh, decide by themselves what they think is halal. This is just a descriptive statistics. Uh, I'm not going uh, through that because we don't have the time. It's just to let you know that I did my homework. And the more important thing is uh, that, uh, that slide because it shows the confirmatory factor analysis that we have run. And um, yeah, perhaps it's, it's interesting to, to know in before what was the sample we had run that. Um, I do together with a colleague from Nuremberg a project on the role of religiosity in uh, refugees uh, coping with life. 
So we have a sample of uh, Muslim refugees from Syria that came to Germany and uh, they are about uh, 16 to 24 years old. So we focused on uh, the adolescents or the young adults. And um, the, the basic question of the project is how do they cope with their new life in Germany and uh, is religion a resource in coping with that new condition or is it a risk that does hinder integration or something like that. With, on that sample, just for your mindset, they have been risen in a Muslim context. They moved to Germany for various reasons and now they are living in a more or less Christian, secularized uh, culture and they have to adapt somehow. And then uh, with that, um, uh, on that sample, we can see that uh, the availability and the importance really uh, make up two distinct factors, but the four items uh, do not make up several factors. So, according to that uh, result, halal is a, a comprehensive concept and the participants uh, distinguish between the importance of halal and the availability of halal. Let's go on with the validation uh, from a more external perspective. Uh, you see here the mean values uh, of the um, availability. Although the columns differ in height, the effect size is not little, it's complicated, so there's no effect. If it's about availability, the, 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 the male and the female respondents do not differ uh, in the, 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 when they are asked uh, about the halal things. And that's pretty reasonable because they have the same shops. So uh, it's, it's, it's rather okay that there's no, no uh, difference between them, otherwise uh, it would be bad. Things change when we, when we check for the importance and you have the, the picture perhaps you, you have from very many studies that uh, the, the female participants take things more serious as uh, the, uh, the males when it's becomes, uh, to, uh, that it comes to religion. We have it here, that are small effects but uh, checking the figures that's fair, so also this is uh, okay. In, in, uh, because we wanted to test that. And a, a final uh, test of external uh, validity was to check the relationship between a, a common, a well-known uh, measure of religiosity. We took the centrality of religious scale in its Muslim version. Um, and you have, with that scale, the difference between males and females too. And what is even more important, both factors correlate with um, religiosity. So we assess some sort of religiosity and uh, the importance of having halal goods is even more correlated than the availability. Although this makes sense in terms of external validity. So to come to a conclusion, the halal scale we, um, we developed uh, shows some nice internal and external validity, so at least in our test sample it worked out well. Um, we are particularly proud that uh, we can counter the, the Muslim critique that there is no clear distinction between halal and har haram because we have not it in our scale. Um, the great question or the question we still have uh, to, to go on is uh, we have just a small sample, will that scale um, show the same effects in different samples? That is still research to be done. And of course, since you are, or as you are an audience that is very uh, sympathetic to empirical theology, you're very welcome to go on with this research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Rigo, because we are noticing that a nice mix is coming up of more conceptual papers and more empirical papers, and that helps a lot also to keep things interesting and uh, different also, we may say. 
And so we go to the next uh, presentation um, by Professor Jaco Dreyer from the University of South Africa. He will talk about 30 years later reflections on the human rights and religion research project in South Africa. Thank you, Professor Dreyer. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to be here. It is really uh, wonderful to, to be here where we honor our colleague, uh, Prof. Francis Vincent Anthony. Um, I decided to, to go back a little bit in time, um, 30 years ago, and uh, as you can see there from, from the title of, of this short presentation, um, in, uh, yeah, maybe just to, to say, I, I will just attend to three aspects. First of all, a, a brief description of this uh, research program. Um, and the reason why I bring it here is because I think when we consider empirical research and public theology, this combination, what can we learn also from projects that we have already done? Uh, so not only... Uh, uh, conceptually and, and empirical scales and so on, but also in terms of the organization of the research and how we approach it, etc. What, uh, what can we learn from these projects in, in order to also undertake better uh, research in the future? So I will briefly describe this uh, project, then I will reflect uh, very shortly on it and, and discuss some possible implications. So the research uh, on religion and human rights started um, actually in the early 1990s. Uh, Professor uh, Johannes or Hans von der Fen of uh, the, then it was still the Catholic University of Nijmegen, um, and uh, a colleague of mine at the University of South Africa, Prof. Henny Peterse, they uh, connected uh, via colleagues and via the network of the IAPT and they discussed the possibility of doing a research project on religion and human rights. Now, why it was so important at that stage, you will remember 1990, uh, Mandela was freed. Um, it was actually a very tumultuous time in the history of South Africa between 1990 and 1994 when we had our first general election. And now in uh, 27 April, we will celebrate 30 years since we had our first uh, elections. So it's exactly 30 years ago that, that, we, uh, that we changed to, to a democracy. So, but this period, uh, Professor Hans van der Ven had the, the foresight and the vision that this might be an opportune time to, to do research on religion and human rights attitudes. Now, at that stage, human rights discourses was not part of the um, anywhere to be seen in the government at that stage, the Nationalist Party. Uh, it was not part of our of the vocabulary, but the ANC and some of the other parties lobbied, of course, for for this, and it eventually became part of our constitution with the Bill of Rights, etc. But so in 1991, uh, Van der Ven came to UNISA and uh, we considered and started working on this project and I, as a junior researcher, became involved. So in 1994, we drafted the first questionnaire and we uh, tested it and finalized it. And as you can see then, um, this project was run from 1994 to 2004. The data collection took place um, in 1995, 96, first round, the second round, 2000, 2001. Now that is something that was also quite important. We decided on a longitudinal study, uh, which I think was a very wise choice because we wanted to see if there are uh, shifts in, in the attitudes o over time. And uh, we decided also to focus on young people because we said that they will be the future leaders um, of the country. So these people that we, in 1995, interviewed, may, they will be now in their mid-40s, um, uh, probably uh, leading companies and being uh, in, in uh, all spheres of, uh, of life. So it's interesting also when, to, when we reflect back on these results, uh, what, they, what their attitudes were. 
We uh, focus on uh, the Anglican and Catholic Church affiliated schools in Johannesburg and Pretoria. So it was very difficult to access the schools. It was a time when uh, we were not allowed actually to, to get into the state uh, funded schools uh, because of various reasons, uh, suspicion about, um, yeah, it was a time, as I said, of t tremendous uh, suspicion. So we did this research and uh, that also shows the, the difficulty of, of sampling in, in sit, uh, situations like this uh, when there's no stable uh, democracy. But eventually uh, we did uh, the research, we, um, uh, the book was published, uh, Is There a God of Human Rights? Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, it it uh, contained uh, basically a summary of our results. But I will come back to, to that. This project became the, in a sense, um, the, uh, yeah, it gave birth to two international research projects. The Research in Human Rights Project 1, that ran from 2005 to 2010, and then the uh, Religion and Human Rights 2 from 2011 to 2017. Um, we didn't participate in the first round, but in the second round, uh, Prof. Zibitz invited us to, to join again, and so we then uh, did uh, research, and this time we broadened it, and we managed to get into state schools, and we did it in the north and the center and south of, of South Africa. So this is just a very brief uh, um, overview. In order to evaluate this uh, research program, you will of course have to, to consider things like the relevance, the effectiveness, the efficiency, impacts, sustainability, coherence, etc. Now, I'm, of course, we don't have time for that. I just have here a, a few remarks uh, that I think is, uh, that we sh should take note of. First of all, I think the project theme uh, was so important at that exact time. So for me, I think as uh, theologians, we have to consider what is happening and have the ability to see opportunities. Um, and I think Hans von der Fien had that ability to see this is an opportunity, this is a time of tremendous change in the country. Um, so that was for me uh, something that I've learned from him. Secondly, the importance of collaboration and uh, networks. And uh, yeah, in, in this project, uh, you can see the, the results. Uh, it became internationally and so many uh, other studies and it gave rise to, to networks, etc. So I think that, that was also something uh, I think very important from this uh, project. Thirdly, the importance of longitudinal research. I think uh, that is really something that uh, gives one a better insight in, in, uh, in, in changes in society. And to do longitudinal research is difficult, but I think it is, uh, it is worthwhile. Um, and I can also add the, the comparative uh, aspect, which I think in the international project that became really one of the, the focus areas. Um, and then, of course, uh, we had many interesting results, which I contact and publications of all these esteemed colleagues, etc. But actually, my focus is more on, on not so much on the, on the negative, on the critical, but what I considered where we could have done better and where we can learn from this uh, project. This is actually um, what made me think of this topic. When I consider it now, I, I realize it was actually a European project in an African context to a great extent. It was conceived um, very much within the uh, Western framework there was hardly any collaboration with the, with the people in South Africa. We have a board of international scholars who looked at the proposal, but thinking back at that time, it was hardly anyone from, from, uh, from South Africa. It was a very specific set of people participating. Um, so I, th I really think when we do this type of research, and that is also, in a sense, my plea, that we 
will really consult with, with the context, with the local people, with those, the stakeholders, those uh, with whom we do the research. So that was really something I, I think we, we, we didn't do it well. Um, also, the negotiation about research project, the aims, etc. It was a one-sided, it was basically a top-down approach. We went to the schools, we said, this is it. Um, uh, basically, take it or lose it, <laughs> and we sometimes we lost. But I think there was really no negotiation. So I think we, we have to learn from that, um, that we have to do it differently. And the third thing that struck me was that we gave very little feedback to, to the stakeholders. Um, we hardly went back to, to the schools and we didn't try to communicate our results uh, to the public sphere. Um, now those days were, were difficult, it, it was not the social media, etc. But even then we could have done much, much more. So I think uh, the, the danger is that we do the research and we have all these wonderful publications and we feel good about it, but so what? Who benefits from, from this research? Does it make any difference to these people in their lives um, and, and so on? So I recently, and my colleagues who were at Ziegen with the ICERT will know that I worked on the, the whole notion of research integrity. Um, there's a Cape Town statement on fostering research integrity through fairness and equity, and uh, those who are interested can search it on the internet. But basically, uh, principles for how to go about doing research in, in other contexts, um, so that you really become inclusive um, and, and uh, yeah, in, in a sense to, to do better than what we have done. And then, uh, Another thing that, that struck me was uh, the whole idea of human rights, the whole way in which we conceptualized it, phrased it, uh, in a sense trying to sell it, was, was a very uh, Western kind of, of notion of, of human rights. And the critique from my colleagues at that stage, I, I didn't really understand. Um, now reflecting back on why I sometimes got such a negative feedback from my colleagues, it, it makes a bit more sense. That this was basically a conception born in another context and not really trying to negotiate with the complexities in, in a different context. I just give uh, here uh, one, one example. In South Africa, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, Afterwards, there was a lot of um, negative uh, reaction after a while, saying that it actually stifled the whole, um, yeah, basically the revolution with the goods of it. If there was no, not a, a lot of violence, but also the bad of it. The, there was no real um, economic restructuring. There was no sacrifices made um, or not in, uh, sufficiently enough so that our society today is still very much... Uh, like it was 30 years ago. If you go to South Africa, the spatial separation is, is still there. You will see the black township and the, uh, basically the white uh, suburb with some uh, more well-off uh, people of, of color, etc. But the spatial development uh, has not really changed that much. And so the question is that human rights and all this emphasis and the Bill of Rights and all these beautiful things about economic rights, what difference did it make? So I just have here two quotes um, for you to reflect on. The first one is, the African experience from the colonial period onwards has been one of state coercion, little legitimate authority and the attempt when it happened to build a moral community through state ideology of one form or another. The only conception which comes close to measuring up to a moral community today is no longer sought within African popular culture, but within what is sometimes the a human rights culture, important from the West. Now, this is a quote um, from Mutua by New Cosmos. So, in, in a sense, and, and the second quote, will, uh, I, I will explain what I mean by this. New Cosmos writes, uh, these rights, even though fought for and achieved through popular struggles throughout society, are supposed to be delivered and guaranteed by the state. They are taken out of popular control and placed in the juridical realm 
where their fundamentally political character is removed from sight so that they become the subject of technical resolution by the judicial system. The people are forced, if they wish to have their rights addressed and defended, to do so primarily within the confines of or in relation to the state institutions of the judiciary. Now, the whole argument here is that this whole human rights discourse actually pacified the, the citizenship. It, it led to a passive uh, way of, of, uh, of dealing with, with human rights because the only way that it could be activated was via the state. And the state actually used this discourse to, to, to pacify the, the, uh, the citizens. So if you reflect back on the 80s, for instance, 70s or 80s, there were many, many uh, churches and organizations involved in the struggle for freedom on, in Africa and South Africa. And it was an absolutely vibrant scene, also theologically and with churches and organizations. Now, after this human rights discourse and all these uh, things came into effect, it is quiet, there's almost no energy, there's nothing left. And these authors explain part of it is that the human rights discourse is, is becoming state organized. And the moment it's under state control, it loses the, the uh, ability to motivate, etc. So I just have one quote here from, from a 2000 paper that we write, uh, and you will know, recognize it. It's about the actions that you will take um, for, to, for human rights and so on. And, and we write here, yeah, the, the rest of the students are fairly quiet, peaceful, law-abiding citizens. Now, we, we phrased it as if it's very positive, but in actual fact, when you read uh, authors like New Cosmos and the, the, the way in which human rights discourses are used, it's actually something that we should have picked up. This is exactly what is happening. People became very, very quiet, passive, etc., due to the state uh, control of human rights uh, culture. Okay, so just to end, uh, last slide. When we think of empirical research within the context of, of public theology, I don't think there's any, any need to, to argue for the importance or, or the significant uh, role of empirical research. You've seen the re results here um, of other studies as well. But my plea is to do it with, with integrity, to, to really engage with the with the local context. Um, the challenges of intercultural research are immense. Um, so uh, that is actually the one thing that I think we, we really could have done much, much better in our human rights uh, project is to uh, make it much more uh, suitable for the, uh, for the specific context. So I'm just asking here, our colleague Prof, uh, uh, Anthony is an is a expert in inculturation, but also in, in, in empirical research. And I, I think this, the intercultural sensitivities that we have uh, in, in our theories about uh, faith, I think the same can be applied to, to research. And uh, our Prof. Francis Vincent, I wish you all the best in your uh, research uh, going forward as uh, both uh, expert in inculturation and in empirical research. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dreyer. Now, according to the program, we have 15 minutes of discussion, which I freely interpret as the possibility for the audience to add their ideas, their comments, and if they want, also their questions, knowing that they will be answered after in our free discussions that we might have after the end of this, because I don't think that 15 minutes can take also the answers. So the floor is yours for additional comments, please.
duty must earn the human right. So his idea was, in spite of the fact of bringing down a whole empire, the largest uh, at that time on earth, uh, who fought and brought justice and freedom to his country, when he was asked, he was asked about human rights, he disagreed and he said, no, it's duties first, then you earn the right. Thank you for your comment. Please, more. <laughs> yes, please. Without destroying the other, 
in my in thinking about human dignity. And even the interculturality that uh, Professor Jacob was uh, pointing at actually rests on this. It is not about my capacity, it is not about my moral superiority or my, um, let us say, resilience and my, my power, but it is about my relationship. It is about the relationship that I can build <coughs> where I am and take it forward to the entire humanity where human responsibility, human dignity, human rights can be certainly assured. Thank you also to the colleague for this further insight. We have some time for a couple more. Yes, please. Thank you for your, for your talks. I was happy to see uh, Catholic social teaching being quoted on human dignity. <clears throat> but actually, if you look at a little more attentively to human to Catholic social teaching, human dignity is not founded only on or mostly on moral dimension and the rest. There's something deeper in that. That is what is what we call of late ontological dignity. Something that belongs to human being for what being human. I think if you remove that ontological foundation of human dignity, dimension of human dignity, these are the consequences we will have. We will be focusing on rights and not on human. Rights is what you may recognize, you may not recognize, but that rights, as long as it is based on what is human, that human takes a little more than what is moral. Moral is it is essential, and there are the three elements that are pointed out they are good, but I think probably it is incomplete, according to me. You need to go, at least from a Catholic social teaching perspective, human dignity is not achieved, it is given. It is not what you make out of it, it is what you receive. And that goes to a fundamental aspect of human dignity that comes from the creator, or but just the fact that you are human. Whether we're able to morally express it or not, doesn't matter. A human embryo does not express any moral capability. But just because it is human, it has to be respected because it carries a image. I think, it would be, I wonder why in two, three talks, uh, this moral dimension was focused much, and the other part was uh, not sufficiently focused. Is it in a way related to the idea that no, that's too speculative, that is not measurable, that is not calculable, that does not come under empirical research. Whereas the moral expression can be measured, it can be scaled. Whereas ontological dignity perhaps is too abstract, too speculative, but does it have any value? Thank you. Thank you also for this question, which are certainly important to be addressed. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. We have a, 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 yeah, a hand raised, but very shortly because you already talked. Yeah, no, it's just uh, <laughs> uh, an answer. Your question. Yeah, there is a uh, difficulty with, even with the level of uh, empirical theology. Indeed, I think in the International Society for Empirical Research in Theology, uh, for at least uh, several years we were avoiding the name empirical theology because it was church, charged with some ambiguity or discussion and so on. And uh, from my own uh, perspective, I prefer to speak about empirical research and theology, or even uh, what I uh, was claiming in my uh, presentation on uh, theology from below. But that would be uh, matched quite a lot of the ideas of Pope Francis in the way that is Gaudium on uh, uh, theology going out or theology being able to establish a relationship uh, with other uh, uh, disciplines, other uh, ways of wisdom and so on. But yeah, I agree that it's uh, a long way until we manage to convince the academic, uh, uh, the theological academy about uh, empirical methods in theology. Indeed, uh, after many years practicing this approach, I still find okay. resistance and problems, I also have one. especially among the students. When you propose you to my students a uh, research for the piece of the, uh, their PhD doing field work, the normal answer is field work? No, I prefer library work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Luis. One other question? You see? And therefore, it's an incentive to me to delve deeper into the sociological aspects of the interpretation of scripture. The prophets did interpret the society of their time, trying to understand the, the, the inequalities present, the oppression that was there, and so you have lots of incentive given to do not oppress, and do good, and treat the orphan and the widow right <coughs> give rights to the, the poor and the orphan. And I guess there's a lot more of uh, empirical evaluation that we need to do modern society based on what has already been done in those centuries. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for this. <laughs> well, I think um, we, we can go to the conclusion and I invite Professor Raymond Webb from the United States to offer some conclusions. So just, just as a very short, brief batuta to the question, very interesting of the brother there. Uh, if you go to the magisterium, you would not find 30, 40 years ago the historical critical methods in biblical theology and 200 years ago practical theology. So the magisterium develops, theology develops. Yeah, we go forward. Yes, please. Thank you. So what I'm doing is talking under the uh, aegis of a uh, conclusion, which might be um, concluding remarks. So it's, it's not a clearly woven synthesis. So I was wondering, well, what would the model be? The model, uh, uh, model analogy might be uh, my journey here from Fumicino to, to, to uh, when we actually got here which would not have been possible without Carl Sturkins. So it was, a, of course, a, a hugely long walk, finally to the self-service machines, which were attended to by two fellows with a money sack and a gun, both trying to fix the, the workings of the, of, neither one was working. So we finally got through that, then it required running to catch a train which was an hour late, but finally, because it was an hour late, we could get on, and we rode to where all of a sudden, this train isn't going any further, but you need to do this or that, 
Now, what Carl didn't realize was that I thought we should be going in this direction and he thought we should be going in that direction. Well, of course he prevailed and he was right. And we got the, the new train that was only 40 minutes late. And so then after all that, we got to the proper station and there was uh, Professor Francis Vincent ready to meet us. So it was something that concluded on time. And that's the model. I will also try to con in conclude on time <laughs> with, with a bit of chaos. It will only be 10 minutes, but the parts of the, the, parts of the conclusion uh, might be a bit um, concerning. So the first part is several anecdotal situations. The second part is a brief question about the public square to which we are all urged to go. The third is the issues of migrants. And then the fourth is an extended finally. So about a week before I came here, a student asked me, why do we always have to look for the practical theological aspect of everything? He was not pleased with that direction, but I moved away to something else. <laughs> the second was uh, I've participated occasionally in a Muslim Christian dialogue group uh, basically online. It's been going for more than 15 years. So a recent topic was human rights. The whole discussion proceeded with a focus on scripture, the Bible and the Quran. Most of the discussion was by Christians. We spent 30 minutes caught up in the issue of slavery in the Bible and in ancient times and the contention that after losing a battle, it was better to be enslaved than executed. 30 minutes about that. Now eventually I kind of, since I'm not so frequently there, raised my hand and, and said, well, what about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? And they said, well, no one pays much attention to that anymore. That was the end of that. Um, I came onto this scene after many of you, but I've seen developments in practical, empirical, and public theology, as well as some of the struggles. It was difficult for practical theology to get a seat at the table of the 8,000 member American Academy of Religion. Very difficult to get on that program for many years. And also at the Catholic Theological Society of America. And I watched the demise of excellent programs in practical theology at the University of Chicago, one of the supposedly 10 best uh, universities in the world, and also at the University of Notre Dame. Notre Dame insisted as part of your practical theological doctorate you would have at least four semesters of Hebrew, and it went on like that. There were other, and a further thing is, we, we in these four, we have not had enough voices among us, although they're certainly present in other places from Mexico and Central America and South America. A similar struggle, I think, for us, something we're, we're, we're missing. So about the public square, does empirical human rights research with public theology in mind actually get itself into the public square? Now, as we move this discussion forward, the how it's going to happen is, a, I think, a very engaging question, which we don't know so much about yet. There is the handout here of a call for papers related to public theology. You can pick one up one if you want. But it's also an excellent history of where, we, where we've been. And it's written by Professor uh, uh, Francis Vincent. So it's, I think it's very much worth taking. Um, and how many, which public squares, and how many public squares are there? The academic, the political, the civil, the legal, the popular, the religious, media. And I would add also the migrant world, those migrating and those with a hand in whether helping or to trying to prevent them. What about that public square? 
Well, the corner of the world I spend a little bit of attention on these days is the issues of migrants. There are there were 281 million people in motion last year. Prospective migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, internal and external migrants, some willing, some forced. If it was a country, these 281 million people would be, I think, the, the fourth largest country in the world. But who and how and with what force does anyone really stand for them? Well, is that issue so important? If we look at something very close, there are 78 wars going on in the world right now. And there's also, I think, the war on migrants. So it includes anti-migrant positions of political parties for the sake of winning votes, turning people away when they attempt to migrate because they don't quite have the right pieces of paper for entry, failure to facilitate approved quotas. The US has reasonably large quotas of people that can be admitted and doesn't come close to admitting them. Something always gets in the way and that right which should be larger is, is ignored. And then there's forced internal and external migration. We know about the Rohingya people who were forced out of Myanmar and into Bangladesh who wants to expel them again. And we think of Af Afghan refugees being expelled from Pakistan for one example. So the issues are international, they're domestic, Migratory movements certainly vary by location. The migration to, to Europe is different than the migration from, from Central and South America uh, to the United States. Recently, the United States has been deporting half a million people a year, half a million people a year, because they don't have quite the proper papers. Actually, the United States has more than 50 million migrants, which is about one-fifth the world's migrants. It's about 15% of the United States population. We have 10 million jobs not filled. But still, we want to keep people out. Now, there, is, there are migration studies as a discipline, but I think empirical and public theology can make an important contribution from our perspectives. Empirical theology can bring facts and evidence, attempt to discern relevant dialogue issues, and be in dialogue with traditional religions about this as well. Public theology gives us a text for that, for that forum. People migrating to the United States, they do have goals, but yet, yet they're overwhelmed. So I want to get in, I need to get in, I need to cross the border. But that's only the start only to be admitted. Migrants who don't have families in the United States, they have no idea what awaits them in terms of bureaucracy and governmental steps and deadlines and submitting papers and supplying evidence. A lawyer ups your chances of hear, having your, your migration appeal uh, to 30%. But for most people, it's, it's almost impossible. My, and lawyers are, in, they're expensive. Yes, there are pro, pro, pro bono lawyers, but they're overwhelmed. They can't manage the need for lawyers that is the case. And you, and you can't, unless you get the papers filed, you can't get permission to work. And then there's all the vocal and uh, demonstrated opposition to their presence. Welcome to our home, but you're not welcome to our home, and strict rules, strict rules. Empirical theology, public theology can provide beneficial voices in the conversation related to all the situations related to migrants. And now an extended, finally. Many of you were here from the beginning, your contributions, foundation, the framework, significant, and we are taking some time this afternoon to remember and be grateful and at the same time give a peek toward the future. The Religion and Human Rights Project 
was an engaging and productive effort in the field that arose in that context. Many who participated also had to get, keep food on the table for their family and be professors of religious education and their hearts were in practical theology, but everybody needed to be able to eat. But their efforts broadened and internationalized and raised questions and expanded even to the largely untouched but very real issue of emotions. The two versions of the Religion and Human Rights Project questionnaire gave many of us an opportunity to investigate and fine tune and think together and argue and produce an incredible amount of data. Thanks to Hans and the originals, the IAPT and ICERT and the journals. A great thanks for your contributions and also for your collegiality. You and other colleagues have been one of the engines that have energized me through all that time. We can never, I hope, afford to neglect the conversation about religion and human rights. Now, I mentioned before that uh, Professor Francis Vincent, uh, in, in a call for papers, really has put this history all together in a couple of pages where he's looking for contributions to the, to the field. We've been talking about public theology and the need to move into the public square for the past 30 years. Now Pope Francis suggesting this odd extra in regard to Catholic theology and related institutions and foci. We move out of self-referred preoccupations and join with others in an intersectional, interdisciplinary, interreligious voice and action for a better world. Our public theology is needed in the public square. Politicians take up space, make claims, fabricate freely. How do we move forward? It requires imagination and skill. And Francis Vincent Anthony, thank you for bringing us here together to join with all of us in this stimulating afternoon. And for your, where are you, where are you? Ah, yes, for your, for your, for your contribution to empirical theology and related areas, for your vision, for your friendship. So the extended finally has a, an extended surprise. Uh, just <laughs> two words from the leader of the Human and Religion, Human Rights and Religion Project 2.0, Hans Georg Siebert. Well, uh, I thought to thank uh, Francis Vincent, uh, but I was not prepared to to give uh, here not another speech, but uh, to do it in the name of all the speakers of this afternoon. Who are the speakers? The speakers know Francis Vincent, um, and they know him from different international academic societies. And this is the International Academy of Practical Theology. This is the International Society of Empirical Research in Theology. And this is uh, the uh, empirical research group where we many of us uh, uh, referred to today, the Religion and Human Rights uh, Project. So that are occasions to meet internationally. And um, uh, some of us are in one of these organizations, some in two, some in three, and Francis Winton belongs to all of them. So we miss a colleague in future who was really present without being without being uh, in any sense better knowing without being aggressive just a calm i thought when we had an indian uh, visiting professor in Würzburg, and when he uh, left he gave me a little present it was a silver box and so well francis desire you were a catholic theologian why 
you give me a little Buddha uh, as a gift. And he said, it is for tranquility, eh? for the rest uh, in yourself, etc., etc. And very often, I thought, well, Francis Winton has something of this. It's not only his interreligious interest, but he is also a theologian uh, who is not Bill does not belong to the orthodoxy we, we uh, heard about, but uh, to these people who have a really a pastoral theological spirit and impetus. So we lose, we lose in our international academies, or you come for pleasure, but from India in future, maybe it's, uh, it's always uh, a long trip. So we miss you uh, in these societies, not only because your, your, your qualities as a person, but I made a little list of, uh, of some of our publications together. It was uh, when, uh, when we had the ISAT conference here in Rome. We published a book on religious identity and national heritage. So we both edited it. And um, then now finally for religious and human rights uh, a project, we published the book Human Rights Separation of State and Religion, edited it together. And in between, we had a lot of uh, other books. Uh, I will just mention a, a few chapter uh, in human rights and the impact on religion in 2013 on India. Then 2018, chapter in religion and uh, civil human rights, uh, also data from India. Then two chapters, uh, India and Italy, in the book uh, about political and judicial rights. Most of the publications we have done with Francesco, if it was about Italy, or with uh, Karl, when it was about uh, the sample in Tamil Nadu. Then, 2020, a chapter in the book International Empirical Studies, Religion and Socioeconomic Rights. Uh, two chapters, 2021, uh, in the book Ambivalent Impact on Religion and Human Rights, again, Italy and India. And uh, now in the book uh, which was uh, edited by Alexander Weir uh, on religion, citizenship and democracy, uh, also a chapter. Uh, so what I wanted to say with this, uh, you are one of the most stable colleagues in this group, present at every conference, contributing to every common publication we had. Uh, and that is valid for a few of us also, but uh, not valid uh, for all of uh, the people who are joined this group. So that is really what I appreciate. And uh, uh, I mean, it is also uh, for the, the group can also be only be vivid uh, if colleagues are uh, contributing. And um, we lose in you a really a strong contributor to uh, the academic ideas we were dealing with. So that is uh, a pity, but uh, as you know, I'm a little bit older than you. Uh, so I have now some years experience to be a retired professor. And what? What is not? I'm younger? You retired first. How is it possible? It's the German system. You, you retired are, first. <laughs> you are looking so young. I mean, you, you haven't changed. I mean, you, you look like as you like today. It was 20 years ago when we met first. Uh, so, uh, in my case, it's not true. So, uh, and I can tell you, there is also a life uh, behind and after university. And this can be lovely. Uh, and um, I mean, the academic world is still open, uh, and uh, contributions uh, in publications is always possible. Uh, but uh, what we wish you is that this sort of green light is always in front of you, that tells you, yes, go. Yeah, here you can cross. Here you are safe. Yeah? This, is, uh, this is where you can trust in, hopefully. Uh, but um, we have another a gift, and um, uh, I'm no, not technically so, um, uh, so uh, informed yeah. about, uh, about the function of the gift, but I can summarize what I understood, and that is uh, the gift is that you can in 
include, insert here, memories uh, in the meaning of photos. Uh, not for eternity. I think you can move it huh? uh, yeah. and, and uh, include. Will you? You bought it. Uh, maybe. Yeah. It's, it's a digital frame, so he knows what it is. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, you know what it is. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> so please, please say a word uh, about, about the function. Yeah. 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 Okay. You said already the poetic part, the part about the memory. So. And our task is uh, to provide you with uh, some photos uh, of us in different occasions uh, so that you have uh, some memory, um, memories um, uh, in what we have done uh, together. And um, many things we cannot um, include in photos. Uh, in, uh, I remember this uh, wonderful conference in Zagreb where we slept in the priest seminary uh, directly under the big bells of the cathedral and they were noisy every 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> So that we thought religion can really also be disturbing. Uh, uh, and, uh, um, and where we had this Russian secret service person among us, uh, etc. So these are all experiences we cannot uh, put into photos, but uh, some we can. So Francis Vincent, it was a pleasure to collaborate with you. Uh, it was uh, an academic inspiration. And finally, I mean, it is also a part of your spirituality. You are deep devoted to the Lord and to the church and uh, without being clericalistic. And that made you especially sympathetic. So thank you very much for your uh, being with us or for us being with you. And um, best wishes, God's blessing for your future. Thank you. Final words yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm really happy that these friends are here. I didn't believe that they would all come. I just took the names, ten of them. I sent an invitation, thinking that at least three of them would turn out, would be ready to come to Rome to have this uh, seminar or roundtable conference. Everyone at once responded, yes, I'm there. I was simply shocked and positively, <laughs> positively shocked, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Positively shocked me. I was really happy that all of you took the trouble. I mean, you know, uh, coming over here. Of course, we had a, a conference in Siegen. Many of us met there. So from there, we uh, came. They came here, but not all of them. Uh, but even then, it is an expense and time and other and preparing this. Uh, so I was. Uh, I'm simply touched by your uh, friendship. And particularly, I have learned a lot uh, with you, I must say. If I am today what I am, you know, in practical theology and empirical theology, it's uh, greatly uh, your merit. And I must start with uh, Chris because uh, I got connected with him first uh, only because one professor from Nijmegen came here searching for some... Ah, Theo. What's his name? Yeah. And he's doing empirical theology. Yeah. He must contact to him. Yeah. And, and that's how. But that's the beauty of public uh, publishing. So my book reached there, that's and it. then that's Chris uh, called me and said, uh, "You're following our method. So why don't you come?" Yeah. And then and there I found Carl <laughs> and others, and I got connected. I think academic life is one of connecting with people. Otherwise, in isolation, you don't do much. They have been a big challenge to me because I didn't know much about empirical theology and all that, but uh, struggling with them and their criticism and all that has shaped me. And today I can also criticize them. Yeah. So <laughs> that way, that way I'm happy, you know, a certain level. So, uh, so thanks for uh, helping in my journey. And uh, I can't forget any of you. you know, you're always uh, in my memory, in my books, in my writings. Uh, you can see that, and I'll continue. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So thank you, uh, and also I will thank the students and others who are here. Uh, they, some of them uh, went away because they find it difficult to follow English, but uh, yes, they came for the first part to say that they are willing to learn something. 
just by i told them just here by hearing you can learn something anyway they came and i thank you for spending this time and that's also a sign of uh, your friendship and esteem for me and as i said uh, my life continues as joyously as here and uh, i hope to do other research and contact you and you are all welcome to india yeah thank you we can still clarify things so if there is anything to this share this is worth your reading it's by professor francis vincent and it's uh really kind of summarizes it he's going through papers but it just puts it all together so i think yeah put it there. thank you Good, good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, very... Uh.